Welcome to Deep Tech 315. I'm Gene along with Doug from Deepwater. And we have three juicy topics this week. Tesla earnings, separately the FTC, looking at some big uh, AI deals with some of the big tech companies. And last, some of the chip companies have been reported. We'll take it back to the top, Tesla earnings. This is something that we uh, are not Tesla investors, uh, but we do track it closely relative to all the things that Tesla is doing, the impact on the greater supply chain, what's happening in the autonomy, and uh, also what's going on with electrification. And so for those of you who aren't up to speed, is that uh, stock is down about 12% since they reported their earnings. And their commentary around Outlook was surprisingly negative. So when Tesla reports, they put out an investor deck in that there's an Outlook section, and they just usually cut and paste this section about growth that says expect the Kager growth of 50% for the next decade. Some years are going to be higher than others. This time, they changed that and said that growth will be notably slower in 2024. Now, on that call, they did not give any context to what notably slower means. And most of the analysts have taken their estimates from 19% growth for 2024. That's a similar growth rate that they post in 23, down to 13%. And my expectation is that one is too aggressive. And just quickly to fill in the blanks, why this slowdown in growth is they previewed a next gen uh, manufacturing line that's going to have a couple cheaper models in it. And while they didn't say, or they talked a little bit, about, they didn't give specifics about what these cars are going to be. The mere fact that they're saying that there's cheaper cars coming out has uh, what's called the Osborne effect on their current products where people can pause and want to see what's going to happen in the future. And so that has a negative impact. And Doug, when I when I saw that, I was thinking, I can't believe they did that. Like I had predicted, uh, one of my predictions in 2024 was Tesla is not going to announce this cheaper car. And the reason I gave back in December was that they announced this car, this cheap one, because I knew it was coming, but they don't want to do it in 24 because demand picture wasn't looking very good. And then on top of that, you have the Osborne effect and it would just be shooting themselves in the foot. And it um, made me wonder, is there actually more than the Osborne effect going on here and that they're uh, you know, trying to hide it with the Osborne effect? Maybe I, thinking that the Osborne effect is having a big impact here feels uh, like a lot. I mean, when I heard the numbers and saw the stock reaction, I wasn't that surprised because we've kind of had a bunch of indications that the demand around EVs has not been what the market expected. We had the Hertz news, right? A couple of weeks ago, we've had numerous of the traditional auto OEMs sort of slowing their plans. And, you know, maybe, and maybe the stock sort of reflected this, but maybe the assumption was, hey, Tesla's fully immune from this. Um, but it seems like to some extent, whether, you know, it's 50% the Osborne effect or 20%, who knows? But I think you have to factor in to what right. they're saying that consumer demand is just not as strong as probably everybody hoped it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did talk a little bit about the interest rates and kind of that impact. That's something that they've been saying before. And I think that's probably the best way to think about what's going on this year. It's maybe we split the difference and say half of it's the Osborne effect and half of it is something that some of those other automotive makers, by my count, five of the top seven have pulled back on their EV investments over the past few months, which uh, really brings to the, for me, the central question is, is uh, I don't want to be the one who's kicking the can down the road and say Tesla's always going to turn the corner in a year. But at the same time, I don't want to, uh, I, I want to ask myself the question of, uh, is electrification going to happen? And we all know what's going to happen. Could take a hundred years, could take five years. Uh, but this, this piece that comes back that I believe that they're going to end up on the right side of this, where traditional car companies are pulling back on investing in EVs. It, it looks like Tesla is doubling down. I mean, they have this next gen manufacturing line that Elon's talking about this kind of modular manufacturing, which is pretty fun, whether or not they can pull it off, but lowers the cost of manufacturing. Like no other car makers are talking about that. And so I keep coming back to a position that, it's going to take five, 10 years to get to 35%, 40%, 50% market share of EVs. 
but if that even if that happens, I think they're making the right decisions now to lay the groundwork to be in a good spot when that market does actually take off. And does it just kind of come down to me? That's what this whole conversation comes down to is what's your outlook in terms of when EV adoption actually kicks in? Well, I think when we think about that, like multiple things can be true that are uh, antagonistic to one another. Like number one, I think most reasonable people would agree that Tesla makes the best EVs and it's probably not particularly close. Uh, number two, the EV market can, and it has been taking longer to get mass adoption than I think EV bulls, or maybe even people who were sort of neutral on EVs expected. We're seeing that kind of slow down, run its course this year, and we'll see how long that lasts. And then three, like I also think as you think about that five to 10 year window, do we get to 30%? Do we get to 50%? It's probably somewhere in that range, I would guess. You know, by by year ten, I would be shocked if EVs aren't in that thirty to fifty percent window. I don't think they're above fifty. That would be my bet. I think gas has a longer life than we probably all want to admit. Um, but as part of that component, I think that you know the traditional OEMs are still going to have a place in the market for a really long time. Doesn't mean I think you should be long them because we don't own any of them. Um, but I think that we think about how the auto industry is going to change. Sometimes when we talk about Tesla, we talk about how great the company is, how great their product is. There's like this assumption that, you know, all of a sudden everything's just going to be Tesla and all these other OEMs go away. I don't think that's going to be true. It's going to be this very long sort of drawn out thing. Tesla is ultimately going to be in a great place, but it's just going to take time. I want to hit a couple other topics related to Tesla. One was FSD. They didn't say uh, total miles driven. This is a metric that I've been tracking closely. It's been slowing pretty significantly on a quarter over quarter basis. That's the best way to look at it. So it grew 100% from March to June, the total miles driven. And then June to September, that was uh, 78%. And September, December, it was 44%. So we saw a pretty marked uh, deceleration. The numbers are getting higher. So in a normal circumstance, that's a that's an expectation you'd have is to expect this sequential uh, slowdown in growth rates. But when things are taking off, like a, a, a technology is taking off and getting ready to be mainstream, you'd probably see those growth rates being right around 100%, stay at 100%, which tells me that the number of miles, FSD miles that are driven, those, that was the metric FSD miles driven, still hasn't had that inflection point. So my belief, I'm a believer in autonomy. I think that the world needs it, is that it's still in that category of taking longer. Elon thinks it's a, a year away. You may have heard that before. Uh, so I wanted to give the a quick update on autonomy and then get your take on Optimus, uh, which he said maybe next year Optimus Prime is available, the, the humanoid. Uh, I think I might have laughed out loud when he said uh, maybe next year. Uh, let's just, we don't even need to discuss how, whether- I think, I, I think, think, well, to Elon's credit, I think on the call, he did also say, or he admitted that he is sometimes he optimistic on his timeline. So I'm glad I appreciate his optimism. Um, yeah. <laughs> maybe in uh, some cases, uh, blind optimism, but I wanted to just forget about his timing and all that, but just the concept of the humanoid and the robot. And then the, what Andrew from deep water was talking about, just the world is kind of segmented into two parts of robotic or opportunities. We have vehicles that we move around. And then when we get to where we move around, we go and work. And so it makes sense to have an autonomous vehicle and then an autonomous human, which would be a humanoid. And uh, I would, I mean, to me, that makes a lot of sense. I love your take. Like, uh, let's forget about the technical challenges of, of doing Optimus, but just the concept of a humanoid. Is that something, as Musk would say, could just like unlock uh, unbridled growth in GDP? Yes, it could, but we kind of have to go back to, I think, the same thing we just learned from the EV market. Is there an opportunity to create humanoid robots? I think there is. Is it going to take way longer than we expect? I think it will. I think first, before we even get there, we're going to see a ton of automation happen on the purely digital side, stuff that we're seeing right now with the mm -hmm. breakout of large language models, with the breakout of GPT, so knowledge work, stuff like that. A lot of that is going to get transformed by automation long before I think anything in the physical world at scale gets transformed with these sorts of robots. So you're talking about so, autom automating like 
for lack of a better word, information work. Yes. Okay. Yes. Because but it's the, easier to manipulate bits right. than it is atoms. But when I think about the humanoid, I think the opportunity is just like more the labor market. Like yeah, uh, that's be, the but, wrong way to say it, the, more the physical labor market. Yeah, and I think the, the challenge, and this is why there's potential with that humanoid robot, but I've always felt like the challenge is think about the work that an electrician does. I mean, I've worked as, a, as an electrician before. I know it intimately. Like every problem is different. Every house is different. Pulling wires through every wall is different, right? Setting up uh, HVAC is different in every single scenario. And so when you have information work and you're just dealing with the bits and like figuring out what does language mean, right? Which mm -hmm. is what the breakthrough has been in AI to be able to do physical labor, like meaningful physical labor, like you're talking about and really transform, I think the high paying jobs that is really far away in my opinion. Like that's not mm -hmm. something we're going to see robots do in 10 years. I'd be shocked if an optimist was able to do anything meaningful as an electrical contractor, as a plumber, right? As any sort of tradesperson, could they move boxes? Sure, but you already have Amazon, you know, at scale running robots in its warehouses, moving boxes alongside mm -hmm. humans, um, and they you don't know, need humanoids to do that. I'm a lumberjack. You, you, in my free time, uh, should I be worried about my hobby going away? <laughs> I don't think so. Not for not for a little while. Okay. By the way, my my guess is uh, a little inside talk here. You can translate what uh, tech. Uh, investors think it. they say it's five years out that means we think it's it's close but really don't know when it is or kind of close when they say 10 years it means i really don't know what's going to happen but i think it's going to happen and i was uh, saying that it's 10 years out optimus prime so uh we can go on to our next topic here which is the ftc uh they've gone they're going back now now they're going back and looking at what's happened with Google and, excuse me, Microsoft and OpenAI, Google, Amazon, and Thropic, and uh, basically getting some, uh, their, the share stake, half of it, uh, two, a third of these uh, kind of foundation companies, these anointed late stage private companies that are gonna be so important in the future. Mega cap tech already has an influence on it. And so what does this mean for how the whole AI story is gonna play out if the, FTC starts to exert some some of their force of will. First of all, I don't I don't think they'll be successful exerting force of will here. I mean, we've already seen the FTC lose in the Activision Microsoft case. So there's a big example of uh, you know uh, one of these tech dominant tech giants buying, in fact, another dominant company in an adjacent industry in gaming. Um, and the courts felt like that was not anti-competitive. I think that ultimately, if this ever got to that point, I would have a hard time believing that uh, these deals would be found as anti-competitive. So I'll start there as a baseline. Like, I don't think anything's going to come of this is the short answer. Um, what I think it does do, though, is it highlights that uh, here's the reality of, of building these foundation model companies is they're hugely capital intensive. They require a ton of compute. And who has compute? The hyperscalers have compute, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, the three biggest cloud computing companies in the world. It's not an accident that they are the ones that are ending up funding this. And by the way, part of these deals um, does include cloud credits, right? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of baked into what these deals were all about. And so ultimately, like, I think it kind of highlights the reality that for these foundation model companies, they need access to a lot of capital. They need access to a lot of compute. And it is the tech giants that have both. Love it. We're going to jump to our final topic, which is the chips side. I want you to give a quick take on Intel, uh, their results, 30 seconds, and I'm going to do 30 seconds on ASML. Intel, uh, we have talked about uh, a product that I've been experimenting with using AI to pick stocks before. Uh, that product is called Intelligent Alpha. I have a long short strategy I'm running uh, and it is and was short Intel going into this quarter. So that's my favorite part of the report. Amazing. Nothing nothing against Intel. Um, but I think the bottom line with Intel is, you know, the company has been challenged now for several years. They have competition coming from AMD. They have this uh, broad shift in terms of data center from 
uh, CPUs to now GPUs and accelerated compute, which is something that NVIDIA and AMD are quite good at. Um, and so I think it's just kind of a continuation of that. You know, I, I root for Intel because I want to see them build an alternative sort of foundry solution just from a, a geopolitical standpoint, but the execution has been difficult. Love it. I'll do ASML. Many of you may have never heard of ASML. It's a Dutch company. It's a 350 billion US dollar market cap company. We do own it in the Deepwater Frontier Tech uh, ETF, ticker LOUP. Had a great quarter. Uh, stock's up, call it 15%. On their report, they build machines that go to like TSMC and eventually to Intel for their foundries or Samsung and their foundry. Uh, they, they, they sold a, a whopping uh, 15 of those machines in the December quarter. They run about $200 million a pop. Uh, so very, there's no other company that can do this. And uh, the expectations that they were going to sell four. So uh, I think this is another great example of all of the goodness that's going on at the hardware level. Uh, we've talked about in the past, we do also own TSMC, ASML, TSMC, they go hand in glove. And that's a wrap for this week in Deep Tech 315. On behalf of Doug, I'm Gene. Bye for now.